stroke, the brain equivalent of a heart attack, will affect 15 million people worldwide. Every two seconds, someone will have a stroke. And sadly, stroke is the fourth biggest killer in the UK. Almost two thirds of people who survive a stroke will leave hospital with a disability. These are frightening and heartbreaking statistics, but there's some hope on the horizon with the rapid development of new knowledge and treatments for stroke survivors, which harness the brain's natural ability to repair and rewire itself after injury. Welcome to episode 11 of Better Brain, Better You, where we're trying to cultivate healthy brains and build better mental well-being at every stage of life, from troubled teens to older adults. I'm your host, Dr. Ben Webb. I hope you're staying safe and looking after yourself in these crazy times, and thanks so much for spending time with me today. It's great to have you here. Today, I want to discuss a topic that's been the focus of my lab's research for a lot of my scientific career your brain's ability to repair itself after it's been injured or damaged by a stroke, and how new and innovative forms of rehabilitation are harnessing this neuroplasticity to improve the outcomes and quality of life of stroke survivors. It's not widely known that you can develop dementia after having a series of strokes. So with that in mind, we have designed a free mini course to increase your awareness of the risks that can lead to memory, decline and dementia, which is a debilitating and degenerative brain disease. The mini course called Aging and Dementia is completely free. So please do go and sign up for the course at ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash age well. That's ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash age well. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'll pin the link in the comments below. Okay, so what is a stroke? And how does it leave someone with brain damage? Well, a stroke is a brain attack. It happens when the blood supply to part of the brain is cut off, killing brain cells. Damage to brain cells can change the way your body works and can also change how you think, feel and sense the world around you. There are two main types of stroke. The most common type is a blockage of the blood supply to parts of the brain by a blood clot or some other brain matter. These are called ischemic strokes and account for about 85% of all strokes. Without blood, brain cells begin to die and this can have different effects depending on where it happens in your brain. The other type of stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke, occurs when a blood vessel bursts in the brain causing extensive bleeding inside or on the surface of the brain. These are much less common and account for about 15% of all strokes. But you can also have what's called a mini stroke or a transient ischemic attack, a TIA, which is the same as a stroke, but the symptoms typically last for less than 24 hours. But a TIA, TIA should be treated just as seriously as a full stroke because full strokes can often happen after a mini stroke. And the effects of stroke depend on where it takes place in the brain and how big the damaged area is. And some of the devastating effects of strokes strokes are things like weakness or paralysis in arms and legs, problems with speaking, understanding reading and writing, swallowing problems, vision problems, pains and headaches, fatigue, and problems with memory and thinking. Also problems with feelings and your emotions. So how does the brain repair itself and can it restore, restore these functions that have been lost or impaired after a stroke? Well, the first six months following a stroke are critical because this is when the brain functions and behaviours that have been lost or impaired are most likely to spontaneously recover. So spontaneous recovery occurs after a stroke when the brain naturally repairs some of the damage it has sustained. And after a stroke, the initial damage due to lost blood flow results in two distinct areas of damage the core and the penumbra. So the core refers to the brain area directly hit by the stroke. This area is considered dead and non-salvageable. However, the functions that were controlled by the core area can still return by activating a process that's called neuroplasticity. More on that in a minute. 
On the other hand, the penumbra, which is the area of the brain that surrounds the core, is damaged but not destroyed. And because it is damaged, it does not function correctly. But if this damage to the penumbra can be healed, then many functions will be restored. And this is where spontaneous recovery comes in. So spontaneous recovery refers to the brain's ability to repair or salvage the penumbra itself. So when this occurs, some functions such as speech or movement might naturally return without any medical intervention. And this happens because when the penumbra was damaged, these functions were impaired, but they were never lost entirely. And once the damage resolves, then the brain can regain those skills. <clears throat> so how does spontaneous recovery work? Well, there are three tricks that the brain uses to promote spontaneous recovery. It restores blood flow to the damaged areas, reduces swelling around the damage, and restarts nearby brain activity. And as I said before, spontaneous recovery typically only occurs in the acute stages of stroke rehabilitation, which is usually lasts around six months. But during this time and after it, you can also promote further recovery by taking advantage of your brain's natural repair mechanisms. So while spontaneous recovery mostly occurs on its own, you can increase the range and extent of the abilities you recover by harnessing your brain's neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity refers to the ability of networks of neurons in the brain to change through growth and reorganization. These changes range from individual brain cells making new connections with each other to systematic adju adjustments like one part of the brain adopting a function previously controlled by another part of the brain. So this allows the brain to transfer functions that were once held in a damaged part to a new healthy part of the brain. And you can activate neuroplasticity through consistent and systematic practice of the function, behavior and ability you're trying to recover through things like therapeutic exercises, therapeutic training, or therapeutic learning. And during the period when spontaneous recovery occurs, the brain, the brain also enters a heightened state, state of plasticity. This essentially means that neuroplasticity will operate on turbo drive and you can make incredible gains in a short amount of time. And research has shown that stroke survivors who fully participate in systematic rehabilitation programs make fuller recoveries than those who do not. And about six months after stroke, spontaneous recovery will cease and plasticity will decrease. This leads to a, to a recovery plateau where it might seem as though you have peaked in the progress you can make. In fact, many doctors and therapists used to believe that once a patient reached this stage, their recovery had ended. They would therefore discourage their patients from continuing with therapy. Today, however, research has shown that recovery can continue long after six months. And that is because you can still activate neuroplasticity and potentially enhance it using a range of novel and innovative techniques. I just want to make you aware of a number of promising interventions that try and promote neuroplasticity to help treat the devastating effects of stroke. So it's really important to say that these are meant to be illustrative rather than exhaustive. So most of these techniques represent the application of neuroscience knowledge to rehabilitation techniques. Plasticity after brain injury is often dependent on the experience, experiences of the stroke survivor themselves. So interventions that aim to promote plasticity have maximum impact when they are paired with, when they are paired with optimal periods of training and experience in the right sort of environment. So this typically involves practice or repeated experience of the behavior or ability you're trying to recover, whether that be training the movement of a weak arm or leg, practicing production of words and phrases when you have problems speaking, learning a demanding visual task when you have sight loss, practicing verbal recall when you have problems with your memory, or psychological therapy for managing your feelings and emotions. So practice or repeated experience of a behavior or ability on its own can be sufficient to improve the functional impairments caused by a stroke and are the backbone of most rehabilitation programs. But in terms of the interventions that promote neuroplasticity, several forms of non-invasive brain stimulation have been examined as a means to change brain function. So these include transcranial magnetic stimulation, which uses a magnetic field to stimulate or suppress activity in certain parts of the brain to promote neuroplasticity. And when paired with training or repetitive experience, Transcranial magnetic stimulation has produced promising improvements to the function of stroke survivors with movement, language, and vision problems. 
So pharmacological or drug treatments like fluoxetine, commonly known as Prozac, and used for treating depression, have also been used for remote plasticity and improve the motor function of stroke survivors. Other drugs like Dinepazil have improved the functional recovery of cognitively impaired stroke survivors. And in many cases, drugs have larger effects on neuroplasticity and behavioural gains when paired with an activity or training regime. So many different forms of physical rehabilitation have also been found to produce functional improvements to movement deficits after stroke. So for example, constraining the arm and hand during physical therapy, robotic assistive devices and training both arms together are all examples of interventions that have led to improved recovery of movement following stroke. And aerobic exercises, as I've mentioned in previous podcasts, are also incredibly effective at promoting the growth of new neurons and neuroplasticity and protecting against memory and cognitive decline. Cognitive training can be thought of as a direct extension of physical therapy to the non-motor aspects of the human brain, and new neuroscience-driven approaches to cognitive training are starting to be more widely used. For example, the cognitive deficits after a stroke, particularly in verbal learning and memory, can be improved by intensive computerized cognitive training exercises that focus on the processing of sounds and speech. And finally, and perhaps one of the most exciting applications of neuroscience to stroke rehabilitation is neurofeedback, playing back your brain activity to teach you how to control it. It enables a stroke survivor to take control of their own brain activity to promote activity and plasticity in specific areas of their own brain. Neurofeedback provides real-time information about the stroke survivor's own brain activity, which can be used to develop self-learning strategies to control these brain signals. So when the stroke survivor learns to control the activity of specific brain areas, this can lead to measurable changes to their behaviours that are controlled by the function of these brain areas. Neurofeedback has huge potential for the rehabilitation of stroke and many other brain disorders and diseases. It has already led to significant improvements to the movement and sight of a number of stroke survivors. So there you have it. Some of the latest neuroscience techniques techniques that are being developed for promoting plasticity to improve the functional outcome and quality of life of stroke survivors. As I mentioned at the top of the show, it's not widely known that you can develop dementia after having a series of strokes. So with that in mind, we have designed a free mini course to increase your awareness of the risks that can lead to memory decline and dementia. The mini course called Aging and Dementia is completely free, so please do go and sign up for it at ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash agewell. That's ologyonlinecourses.com forward slash agewell. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'll pin the link in the comments below. Before we finish, if you're worried about yourself or someone else who is at risk of a stroke, it's vital to know how to spot the warning signs of a stroke. Using the FAST test is the best way to do this. Face, has their face fallen on one side? Can they smile? Arms, can they raise both arms and keep them there? Speech, is their speech slurred? Time, time to call an ambulance if you see any single one of these signs of a stroke. These are, these are the three most common signs of a stroke but there are other symptoms you should also take seriously. They include sudden loss of vision or blurred vision in one or both eyes, sudden weakness or numbness on one side of your body, including your leg, sudden memory loss or confusion, sudden dizziness, unsteadiness or a sudden fall, especially especially with any of the symptoms, these other symptoms. So if you see any of these signs, getting yourself or someone else to hospital as quickly as possible, as possible will give you or them the best chance of making a speedy recovery from a brain attack, a stroke. So I hope you found this episode useful. Thanks for tuning in today and I look forward to spending time with you next time.